and welcome to Keep the Bastards Honest, the podcast of the Australian Democrats. I'm your host, Alana Mitchell, and on this episode, the voices of us made themselves heard and transformed Australian politics. I hope everyone has had a lovely summer and you're raring to go for 2023 as we usher in a new political year. I'm so excited to be able to introduce our first guest of the year. Tim Dunlop is a writer, researcher, speaker and thinker who's written extensively on grassroots democracy and the role of the media, as well as technology and the future of work. And in December last year, his fourth book, Voices of Us, was published. At the 2022 federal election, Australia voted not just for a new government, but for a realignment of the way in which our political system works. Voices of Us is a book about how that happened. Regular listeners to the podcast will know that I'm a huge fan of Tim's writing, as well as his Twitter game. So it was an incredible privilege to chat to him about his new book and about our democracy and our media. If you want to pick up a copy of Tim's book, we have a link in the show notes to get it at a discount through Booktopia in either its ebook or analog edition. Tim, Steve, and I pay our respects to the traditional custodians of the lands upon which we met and their elders past and present. Sovereignty never ceded. Tim, first, like, thank you so much for coming onto the pod to talk about your amazing new book, Voices of Us. And, and firstly, congratulations on what is a brilliant read. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and, and uh, I'm sure Steve did as well. And, and the, I found it fascinating the sort of the historical aspects of what you sort of dived into because I mean everyone's familiar with the rise of the community independence and the voices of Indi model, but you placing it into a, a bigger historical context I think was brilliant and a really valuable sort of contribution to the discussion around our, our political sort of transformation that we're going through. Is, is that sort of what you intended to set out to do? Um, th- thank you very much for those con- com- comments. I really appreciate it. I-, I sort of had two goals with it. One was to capture the moment because I thought it was um, quite an exceptional moment in Australian politics. And that's what encouraged me to fairly late in the day to decide to write a book about it. But it was also one of those things where I realised I had a lot of material. I'd, I'd actually spoken to the voices of groups. Um, I interview Zali Stegel at one stage back in 2019, plus that kind of deeper historical stuff. You know, that's been my obsession for the last 20 or 30 years. My PhD was on Australian citizenship and all of that, and I drew on that research fairly heavily. So that that's kind of how I was able to write the book, in you know, on, on a pretty tight deadline, as it turned out, because I had a lot of the material there. So it was really that. It was capture the moment, but to put it into historical context. And I felt like I was in a pretty good position to be able to do that. It's a great read, Tim. I, I, I got through it in two sittings. Um, wow, okay. You know, sort of I, I, I got through the first half of the book in, in, in one go in the course of a few hours and then I sat down again uh, and read the second half of the book in, in the next sitting in another two or three hours, maybe, oh, okay. maybe. A page turner, a political page turner. Well done. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's great. That's No, no writer doesn't want to hear that. <laughs> the election in, in May this year felt significant in many ways. And I think there were there were quite a lot of reasons for that, but certainly the role played by independent candidates was absolutely a key part of what made this election something something special to be a part of. And Elena and I were both candidates at this election for the Senate, so it was special in that regard. But just watching what was happening in those electorates, which had a community backed independent, you know, one of those voices of candidates or voices for candidates, it was uh, it was really, really special to watch that come to fruition and then the, the success that they enjoyed at the election itself. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I had, had a very similar failing. And I think what's interesting about it is that it was actually the culmination of a lot of trends that have been building for a very long time, probably for at least, most people 
cite Kathy McGowan as the start of it, but I, th- I think the issues go back further and deeper than that. So those changes that drift away from the two parties um, had been happening for a long time. And then it sort of all came together with the, the voices of not, not just the movement, but their community engagement methodology, sort of, I, I, I think of it as their secret source, but it was also the magic spell that existed at exactly the right moment and, and captured people in those communities. And so you had this shift away from the two, you know, an obvious desire to vote somewhere else and then a lot of those people didn't really have somewhere to put their vote. There was nowhere else to go. But then suddenly these these community independents showed up and people felt very safe putting their vote with them. I think Kathy McGowan was a great role model in that respect and the fact that she was able to hand over to Helen Haynes so that it didn't just revert back to the Liberal Party. It stayed independent. Indi stayed independent. I think that inspired a lot of people and it showed it could work, that the world didn't fall apart if you didn't vote for the Liberal Party or the Labor Party. Um, And then the candidates that emerged from the process were you know, singularly impressive. Each and every one of them is an outstanding candidate, especially in regard to their electorate. So all of that came together and then bang, you know, you just had this monumental change, you know. So yeah. so not only did you for the first time ever get more than 30% of people voting for someone other than the two major parties, yeah. um, but that actually converted into seats and a, mm. and a substantial crossbench, the biggest crossbench we've ever had in the lower house. So it, it all adds up to a major change. Do you think the Morrison government sort of inadvertently contributed to it? I'm just thinking of like the, the because of the rise of these astonishing <laughs> female candidates and Morrison's response to the March for Justice, was responding to it literally in Parliament by suggesting that these women were fortunate that they weren't being shot at, you know, rather than sort of going out, <laughs> you know, literally leaving the building and going and talking to them. Do you think maybe that, that sort of contributed to this inflection in time? Not so secret, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think... <laughs> I, I think, yeah, he, he was one of the things, he, he was a catalyst. I, I think it would have happened without Morrison, but it maybe wouldn't have happened until the next election. The, the argument I make in the book is that all those changes were happening, that people were very concerned about those three key issues that the independents campaigned on, gender issues, climate change, and political integrity. And in Every single one of those, Morrison represented exactly what everybody hated, yeah. you know, or was concerned about with those things. So he was he was prancing around the country, embodying this version of politics that people really disliked. Mm. So he he was absolutely a catalyst. I think the the fact that as prime minister. His own party was keeping him away from certain electorates because they knew his mere presence would suppress yeah. the vote. Is is a pretty dire I, state I, of affairs for a political party. I wonder the extent to which having Barnaby Joyce as deputy prime minister and the likes of Matt Canavan being so influential over things like climate change policy and and you know like energy policy contributed as well i mean like morrison absolutely but the strength of that argument that sure you vote for jason felinski who by all reports is a sensible and 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 moderate fellow that because of the coalition system he's going to vote in the same way that barnaby joyce dictates um and and what barnaby wants is is actually being driven by canavan because of his influence in coal country in Queensland kind of thing. Like, it can't have helped. <laughs> no, it, it definitely didn't. I think, the, again, the person of Barnaby Joyce was, sure. he, he was almost as disliked as Morrison, maybe yeah. more in some circles, um, and represented the same failure in those three policy areas. But the point that you raise about party discipline, essentially, that no matter what a candidate, a Liberal candidate, or a Labor candidate for that matter, says in their electorate, 
it doesn't matter. They're going to they're going to vote the party line because that's that's how Australian politics has strict party discipline, and that's what's going to happen. When I spoke to Voices of McKellar in 2019, so before Sophie Scomps had emerged as the candidate, she was at the talk, but she wasn't the candidate at that stage. That was precisely one of the things I said to them because I'd been talking to the you know various people up there and they'd all said yeah you know Flinsky's okay he's you know we don't we don't dislike him it wasn't like Warringah where Tony Abbott was the whole point of Voices of Warringah was to get rid of Tony Abbott they didn't feel like that with Jason Flinsky but I, I said exactly that to them you know he, he can be as understanding as you like and from what I've heard he is when you're talking to him but at the end of the day he's going to vote the same way as Barnaby Joyce and that became a real I'm not taking credit for it. I think they'd no. figured that out for themselves. But that became a real key point in the success of the independence as people. It, it was interesting to me, like a, a year before I spoke to McKellar, I spoke to Warringah, and I noticed this with the crowd that we had there that, you know, very well educated and switched on people, but I don't think they really kind of realised the extent to which that party discipline worked. And we talked about a similar thing there. And you could see a genuine, oh, yeah, you know, they hadn't really thought about that, that it doesn't matter what they say in the, what the individual candidates say, they're going to vote the party line at the end of the day. And once that really sinks in with people, that becomes a really major selling point for the independents, I think. It just reinforces the notion that, the independent candidate represents the community. The party candidate represents the party. Yeah. And and that's what people really didn't like anymore. The notion that, uh, you know, Jason Flinsky would end up voting the same as Barnaby Joyce had such, like, it was a devastating cut through. I mean, they were, you know, heartland liberal seats. And that's sort of, I think that, that line really sort of cut through the final threads of loyalty to the party. No, I'd, 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 I'd agree completely. That, that just... It was like the last straw, the final thread, as you say, and um, and it, and it was extremely powerful. And all of the independent candidates used it um, in in their electorates. You know, it, it became a really telling point. I think I have found it interesting to watch how Bridget Archer has gone against that model. Okay, you know, in in some key and and only in some. But in some key votes where, like recently with the Morrison censure motion and previously on the Integrity Commission, and I, I, I want to go back trying to think of what it was prior to that, but there was another one where she crossed the floor and voted against her party, but she stands out for being basically the only one yeah. willing and or able to do so. It's, it's obviously clear that Josh Frydenberg or Jason Felinski could easily have done the same thing on those key issues if they really wanted to represent their party. That party loyalty has practical limits at least, and Bridget Archer is showing that they exist. Yeah. She's still in the party. She's still representing her electorate. So why not others? And yet they, they couldn't or wouldn't yeah. take that step. Well, you know, there's, there, there's career issues around this, you know, that you, you just don't get promoted within the party if you consistently do it. But they will bear a certain... Uh, and the, and in a degree fairness, of it, right? The Liberal Party more than the Labor Party will bear a certain amount of dissent hmm. um, within the back bench and, and allow different points of view to take place, but they'll put up with it un until the moment that they don't. Mm. And and her moment might be coming. Might come, um, yeah. But, but yeah. it's it's a very different position now because I think the, the the Liberal Party in particular, the coalition, are in a very dire position at the moment and it's probably harder for them to enforce that sort of party whip in the same way that they've been able to in the past just because they're in such dire straits electorally. Yeah. And Are I think, you seeing any signs of them rebuilding? No, not really. I, 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 think, I think the thing to understand is that this structural damage has been done to the party. And this is another thing Scott Morrison definitely had a hand in. And this is true at state level as well as federal level, where they've allowed themselves to be infiltrated 
by fairly extreme elements, often with a Pentecostal twist to what they're doing. And so even if they want to change, they're, they're not structurally able to do it. They, they don't have the numbers, to put it simply. It'll be interesting when the final report comes out from the Liberal Party Brains Trust doing their analysis of what went wrong at the election, which I it might have even come out today. I haven't I haven't actually seen. Certainly the Australian newspaper reported on it yesterday and, and mentioned a few things that are apparently in it. So it can't be far away if it hasn't actually come out at this point. But it's, it's actually a very good example, I think, of the difficulty that they're having in doing these sorts of reforms. Even this report apparently does will not embrace the idea of quotas for women. So it's such an obvious thing that they could do to not actually just literally fix a major problem with their party, their lack of female representation, but to show people that they're willing to do something. And the report suggests that they're not going to do that. So you can take that as indicative of their willingness to really embrace structural change. I, I don't think there's there's much evidence around that they're willing to do, willing or able to do yeah. that at the moment. I'm not sure that they understand yet because the, the, the vibe that we're sort of getting from, say, you know, the remainders in, in the opposition in the federal parliament, particularly from Peter Dutton, is no, 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 the voters are wrong. We're fine. We didn't do anything wrong. But a large number of voters across a large number of blue ribbon heartland seats just collectively lost their minds. It's it's not us, it's you. That's right. <laughs> they, they are reluctant to face reality because facing reality means admitting that everything they've been doing for the past, well, decade probably is, is wrong, that they are deeply out of touch with key parts of Australia, especially in those urban seats. And, you know, what could be better evidence of that than the thrashing that they took in absolute heartland seats, you know, seats that had been liberal um, for as long as there's been a liberal party. And before, you know, they were conservative seats before that. And they weren't just rusted on blue ribbon seats. They were the place where their treasurers came from and their prime ministers came from and where their money came from. And Mm -hmm. they've lost them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's extraordinary, really. I mean, to lose Mm -hmm. the seat of Menzies and then go, no, 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 you know, the voters of Kuyong are wrong. Is, it's, it's utterly bizarre. Yeah, yeah, it, it really is. But like I said, for, for them to really face that is, is to face a lot of really hard truths about the nature yeah. of the party that I don't think they're, they're remotely willing to do. And, I mean, this has been a problem all the way through. The, the leadership changes, Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison, you know, they were, they were all driven by that sort of division deep within the party, the sort of people Steve was talking about earlier, like Matt Canavan and Barnaby Joyce, who have a a ridiculous level of influence over the party in terms of the party room, in terms of the stance they can take on things like climate change and coal mining and the like, is is disproportionate. And, And that's why you had, you know, leaderships collapsing in the way that they did. And... It, it speaks to that deep malaise. Well, it, you know, actually, to, they don't see it as a malaise. You know, they, no, they see, don't. It, as they see a, it as a communication you know, problem. It's a legitimate position of the party sort of thing. But it's, it's just that clearly, electorally, that position does not work at the mm-hmm. moment. And it, and it has a number of elements, not just around climate change and coal mining and the like, but around women's issues and around integrity become a really big thing. And I, I don't think they've even come to terms with that at this stage. So I, I think they've got it, – it's really hard to see them getting back those seats from the independents at the next election. And then even if they – I, I, I don't think it's going to happen. I, I think they're dead, to put it bluntly. I, I, don't think I don't think they're ever coming back. Wow. I wouldn't be surprised to see them win less seats than the nationals at the next federal election. But yeah. I'm curious. I'm curious how you think they're sizing up in New South Wales for the March election. What does that look like to you? That looks like another 
it, it's, it's a very different situation. People think about state politics differently to how they think about federal politics, understandably. There are issues around the voting system in New South Wales that's quite different, which I'm no expert on and, and can't really speak to in any great depth. What I'm saying, basically, though, is that I think there are probably bigger hurdles for the state-based independents to jump over. But having yeah. said that, I think North Sydney, Lane Cove, Cove are, are looking pretty good, actually. I, mm. I, I, I certainly think you'll end up with some community independents on the crossbench, unlike in Victoria here, yeah. where they didn't quite make the hurdle but that was for a, a number of reasons and, and people say well you know it doesn't work at state level look what happened in victoria but victoria was a different different story it was a totally weird election in a lot of ways and and, and actually people like sophie tawney and kate lardner and melissa Lowe did really really well if you look at the two-party vote that they got it's up around the 50 you know it's just shy of 50 percent so they came very close i think their biggest issue was they left their running a bit late for the state election they, yes and the whole notion as you as you would well be aware of the that community-based thing and the the kitchen table conversation approach that takes time you can't you can't fake that and you can't rush it so i think the sydney candidates have much more time i was i was looking at um, I can't think of the woman's name who's running in North Sydney, but she had her first public rallies yesterday, and they yep. were pretty good crowds. They were good crowds. <laughs> up to that, they uh, were good crowds. Yeah, yeah and similarly so, in Lane Cove, Victoria, and, yeah, Lane Cove and I well. can't remember her surname, but a really good showing at the Lane Cove sessions as well. Yeah, so um, you know they've got till March, so I, I think they're in with a reasonable chance. I and I do wonder if. I'm still not sure people are quite back on side with Labor. I think maybe I think maybe they'd be happy to see the end of the Peritot government, but I'm not really sure that they want just to go straight back to Labor. So the pros in in that circumstance, the yeah. prospect of having a crossbench that maybe has the balance of power is actually so a minority Labor government um, yeah. is actually probably more attractive than quite um, possibly yeah. Trump. Labor government. So I think there's a number of elements working um, towards um, a better result for the community independence mm. in New South Wales than perhaps there was in Victoria. We talked about the Victorian election in our last um, podcast episode and kind of said like it was unfair mm. to compare the results of the Victorian election for the independence against the you know stunning results in the federal election. We likened it more to a sort of a ringer or sort of indi level of success rather than you know sort of setting setting people up for the next election cycle rather than you know i think i think the expectation that you would have a clean sweep of independence the victorian election considering as you said it was a weird election i think that's um uh, you know, it's a little bit unfair and, and, and I think to, to measure everything by the success of the community dependence at the federal level is I think it's, it's sort of setting people up for disappointment. Very much so. Yeah, because like, like you said, it takes time and state politics is a bit different to federal politics. There, there's sort of this narrative emerging in the Victorian elections like, oh, well, they didn't have a Scott Morrison type figure to rally against and therefore it's a total failure. And I think that's also unfair because that Morrison crystallised so many issues as, as we discussed earlier, but I don't think to, to embed this kind of transformation into the system, you, you know, you don't need that that polarising figure to fight against it. It, it is a, a longer term. You, you've got to give a sort of roots time to get down into the, the sub subsoil sort of thing. And ironically, I think the, the situation in Victoria, I mean, Dan Andrews, you know, the, the notion that Dan Andrews was polarising was purely a media construct. And ironically... All the issues on which he could have conceivably have been held to account, and and you know the um, the platform that could have been built around that just didn't emerge because the media just strangled it in the cradle. Yeah, no, that's very true. The the media coverage of the Victorian election, if if such a thing is possible, was actually worse than the media coverage of the federal election. It which was is... really kind of embarrassing the um, the way that they went after him, the nature of the things they attacked attacked him on, and I think. I think you make a very good point, is that by going after him about ridiculous things, not just going after him, but like hammering him on ridiculous things like falling down the stairs as if this was 
it was it was just so bizarre. It it hid all the other legitimate things that they could have gone after him on. I'm I'm sure he welcomed it. Absolutely. Because there were, you know, there were some serious issues, not, not least of which, you know, is the, is the state of the budget. There's, there's, there are definite money issues, but that sort of got swept under the stairs, so to speak, and, and, and was forgotten about. And, and things like the logging in state forests and old, old growth forests and, and things like that, which really could have, you, you know, you, can, you could mount a, a, a serious case Absolutely. Um, ar- around those sorts of issues, um, but th- they were all just ignored by the, by the media altogether. So it was it was a very odd choice. I'm, I'm sure at the end of the day, Daniel Andrews cheered every time he saw the front page of the Herald Sun or, or even the Age for that matter, hmm. where they got sidetracked by all this non-issue. I, th- I think the media really misjudged the extent to which most people, despite the hardships. Hmm were kind of supportive of the of the lockdowns, etc., and and thought that he probably did the right thing, and 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 certainly didn't believe that Matthew Guy would have done any better. Wow! So, <laughs> like, yes. it's, it's a yes. I, mean, I mean that's that's the other thing. The quality of the opposition, the Liberal Party opposition down here, was terrible, mm. and and so you end up with this situation where at the 2018 election, Daniel Andrews wins in a landslide, and that this election ends up with even more seats. Yeah. So it's crazy. Um, even, yeah. even though that's, you know, that is partly a product of the, the voting system, I, I, I think it's unfortunate in a sense that he was rewarded with as many seats as he got given the level of primary support that he got. But that's the way our system works. Yeah. And, um, and it's completely legitimate. I'm, I'm not casting any aspersions on the legitimacy of it. Um, I, I would just prefer to say that there was a better match between the proportion of votes you got and the proportion of seats that you got. Mm. You're absolutely right. The the media coverage of the Victorian election was, it, it wasn't just silly, it was damaging to democracy in that he wasn't held properly to account, I don't think. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It was, I mean, as an outside, I mean, I'm in WA, so as an outsider to Victoria, it was truly bizarre to be watching that unfold and, and and because even as an outsider to Victoria, I knew that there were issues that Andrews could legitimately be held to account for and he just didn't see them anywhere. And, like, and literally nobody right. was talking, like it wasn't even that the media wasn't talking about it, his opponents weren't talking about it either. Yeah, that, that's really true. Well, and I think this is the other thing that it, it's worth bearing in mind is that largely the Murdoch media, but not just, but largely the Murdoch media has become such a, an overt propaganda outlet for conservative governments across Australia that they've sucked the conservative governments into thinking that that, that support matters. And it just doesn't in the same way. So they're, they're kind of dragging each other down. I think if the Liberal Party is going to reform, one of the things it needs to do is to rethink their relationship with the Murdoch press because I don't think it's being helpful for them in the way that it was. Certainly it's not swaying elections in the way that perhaps it once could have. Even at the federal election, I would have said that the overt support Murdoch was giving to the coalition at least contained the damage, that it couldn't couldn't stop the couldn't stop Labor winning, but it, it kept their minority smaller than it was. But if you look at Victoria, not even that's true. They they, mm. they couldn't even contain the the size of the victory. In fact, the size of the victory went up. You know, it's um, it reminds me of that story of John F. Kennedy when he was running for president, and during one of the primaries, he won by a very narrow margin. And he said to his father, who was of course bankrolling his whole candidacy, he said to his father. Well, that was close, <laughs> and, um, and his father said, I, "I can buy you a win. I can't buy you a landslide." <laughs> and, and, I, and it sort of felt a bit like that. I, I, I feel like Murdoch mm-hmm. has this conversation with Liberal Party leaders, like, you know, I, I can't buy you a landslide, but I can at least contain the damage. But I'm not even sure that that's true mm-hmm. anymore. To to what extent, Tim? Like, I I, I had the thought recently that. Actually, we're, we're we're thinking of that relationship in the wrong way. That the, the the Murdoch media isn't the propaganda arm of the of the Conservative Party, but that the Conservative Party is the political wing of the Murdoch Empire. Yeah, I I, I think you can certainly make that case. I, I I think the bigger 
issue is that mainstream media has always been a representative of capital yes. <laughs> in, in, in Australian society. And, and I, I think that's probably the most interesting thing about what happens is Australian capital has so clearly been able to rely on the Liberal Party of the coalition delivering them government mm. at a majority of elections. They, they've, they've dominated since the Second World War. If the Liberal Party genuinely does collapse, where does where does capital go looking to get its political influence? So I think this is another because they're not going to go unrepresented. Absolutely, <laughs> they're not going to allow themselves to go unrepresented. So yeah. it'll it'll just be interesting to see how that plays out. Obviously, there's been a you know the the Labor Party over the years, and this government as well has shifted to the right and is you know, much more centrist than it, than it is leftist to the extent that you can give meaning to those sorts of terms. But, you know, mm. it is a much more conservative Labor government than we've traditionally seen. Obviously, some exceptions around that. But it, it'll be interesting to see. I, I, I think it makes a very good case for maintaining a strong crossbench. Mm. I think it's harder to buy out a crossbench for, for it to come under the influence of capital mm. in the way that a party can. Mm. So to the, to the extent that you want to limit their power in the political structures and the institutional structures of Australian government governance, then I think there's a very strong case to be made for a strong crossbench. And I think that's kind of part of what's attracting people. Mm. Always the argument was you need the major parties because that way you get stable government. Mm. So, you know, you can give your second preference and to to somebody you think is actually better, but it flows back to the major parties and that keeps things stable. But I think yeah. what people have realised is the flip side of stability is corruption. Yeah. Yes. So once you establish those two major parties as dominating every institution and governance structure in the country, you open yourself up to corruption. And I think the last government, showed in a, yeah. in a way that was plainer to people than maybe previous governments had, what a problem that can be. And I think that was another mm. thing people wanted to get rid of. And so the attraction of independence, non-party aligned candidates or smaller party candidates, you know, a stronger crossbench, in other words, becomes a very attractive option. The counter argument or one of the counter arguments to a strong crossbench, Tim, is that they become a little obstreperous and a little uh, difficult to, to wrangle and they get in the way of good government rather than helping with good government. Independents like Kathy McGowan and then Helen Haynes, there have been others over the years who have been quite constructive on the crossbench. How do you think the current crossbench is going in terms of being good role models and, and making the case for a strong crossbench in, at the next election? You, you couldn't ask for better. Honestly, I, and I, I say this as someone who doesn't agree with their politics on the whole. I'm, I'm further to the left of them politically. So, you know, I, I sort of have issues around their economic conservatism, as they tend to call it, have, have real issues around that. But, you know, that's fine. I, that, that doesn't worry me. If that, that, that is the nature of democratic governance and there are legitimate arguments to be had about the best way to approach budgetary matters and policy matters, et cetera, et cetera. What I like about the current crossbench, and this includes nearly all of them, whether... Does it include the Greens? In, yeah. I would, in I what mean, you're saying? Yeah, good. Okay. Yeah. Greens in this conversation. Yeah. Is that I, I trust their integrity and I think they are, particularly the community independents, are on a very steep learning curve at the moment, but I think they've also shown themselves very open to taking expert advice in areas where they aren't expert. Um, and, of course, their values come into it and their beliefs, etc. But I, I actually have the impression they can change their mind about yes. stuff. They will not necessarily be locked into a position just because that's what they've always thought. And... I, I don't think you can ask anything more of mm. um, politicians than that to be open to, you know what, when the facts change, Evidence. I change yeah. my mind, you know. And I personally th think that the swathe of people that were elected on the crossbench this time around fulfilled that brief perfectly. Mm. So um, I'm, I'm kind of, I don't line up with them politically at all, but I, 
I trust them. I, I don't think that even if they get some stuff through that I wouldn't actually agree with, that the country is going to fall apart. I'm not confident about that with the the Liberal National sure, Coalition. Yeah. I, I don't trust them at all. And I don't believe that they're willing to change their mind and listen to evidence. They're, you know, we've had 10 years of their governance mm. to know that that's just not going to happen. Tim, the, the, the other thing that I've noticed is that they're not voting in a block. Mm. So they're, they're, they're true to the fact that they are representing different electorates, that those electorates are different in their makeup. Indi is not the same as Warringa or McKellar. McKellar is not the same as Ku Yong, and 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 the representatives from those uh, electorates are approaching it first and foremost as, well, what what does my community need from this bill or from this piece of legislation or from this piece of policy, and then how does that marry up? And and you actually talked about this in the book that notion of how does that interest marry up against the national interest in this in this issue. But they do seem to be taking it issue by issue and 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 not simply negotiating a block vote to provide support or otherwise. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that completely. And I think that's that's a good thing. In the book I argue that it does come up against the issue of once you are actually on the crossbench in the federal parliament, then there is an argument that you don't just represent your community in the same way that you don't just represent the people who voted for you. You represent everybody in your electorate, and in fact, you represent everybody in the country. And what is good for Wentworth might not be good for Karangamite, might not be good for the country. So you can't just make the argument that, well, this is what my community wants me to do. I think there's a big picture. I'm not quite sure that we've had an issue yet that really tests that mm. and, and tests their, I, I, th I think, the inevitable conflict that arises there. Uh, again, I sort of trust them to do the right thing, but yes. who knows? Stage um, three tax cuts, Tim. Yeah, stage three ca tax cuts are probably probably a really good example. When that comes yeah, back. When, yeah. when, that, when that's seriously looked at, then then we'll know a lot more. I don't, you know, I, I cl clearly a lot of them are quite supportive of stage three tax cuts and are clearly a lot of their supporters in their communities would be as well. So it, so it is a real test for them. But, you know, they're smart and it isn't just for or against, you know, there are amendments that can be made, there are changes, there are things that you can do. So it'll be interesting to see how they negotiate that. But I think that's a really fundamental thing, that what is good for Wentworth isn't necessarily good for the country, and they have to bear that in mind. Having mm. said all that, I think they're also very well advised to maintain their independence, to not at all to be seen. I don't think they want to be seen as a party or no. as colluding, overly colluding in, in particular ways because I think people voted for them because they're independent. They didn't. They don't want them to be a party. I, and yeah. I'm, I'm, sure that, I'm sure the independent candidates, uh, the, the members know this. So, you know, I'm very sympathetic to the real politic situation yes. that yes. they have, but this is the nature of politics. It does... Politics is often not about choosing between right and wrong. It's often about choosing between two rights. And that's that's what makes it a difficult thing. And I think they're going to come up against that for sure. And it'll test their skills of persuasion and their commitment to evidence and, and every other thing. But I think they're probably up to the job. Because it's been a long time since we've had high-profile politicians in a position where they can change their mind openly and not have the world end. You know, in the dying days of the Morrison government, it got to the point where they were committing to quite ridiculous positions in the face of all, of all the evidence and the, probably in the face of the own advice that they were getting from public service and, and their own their own advisors because they, they didn't want to give the opposition a, a win. And yeah. it's, I'm curious to see how that, that sort of change in the landscape is going to affect the Labor Party and whether, you know, the Albanese government's going to either find a way out of that particular trap or whether they'll just fall back into it and, and, you know, end up in a position where they sort of, I think, inadvertently sort of undermine their own position by highlighting the fact that the independents uh, have the freedom to change their mind as the evidence change and the Labor Party sort of get locked into the whole, oh, but we can't give the opposition a win on this issue, so we have to commit to the stage three tax cuts or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that's a really good point. And, and I think... 
we've been talking about the challenges that the crossbench faces, but but Labor has huge challenges in front of it. Ultimately, probably so does the Liberal Party, but for the moment, it's really just Labor have huge challenges in how do they manage this. The crossbench doesn't actually have numbers at the moment. They could easily have numbers at the next election. And, and I think, you know, Albanese has shown some willingness to be open to negotiation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But at the end of the day, you know, it's it's a bit of the frog and the scorpion, I think, you know, the jumping on the scorpion's back or the scorpion jumping on the frog's back to go across the river and, and the scorpion stings him and the, he says, the frog says, we're both going to drown. He says, well, it's in my nature. Yeah. You know, so um, I, I, I think that, and, and we saw this with, you know, almost the first thing the Labor government did when they were confirmed in government was to cut the staffing allowance to the crossbench. And, you know, that was that was classic scorpion behaviour. They just couldn't help themselves. They obviously saw the crossbench as some sort of threat to their power. So they did what was in their power to limit their ability to do anything. And and so they cut their staff. So, you know, it's been swings and roundabouts in, in that ex- to that extent. But I think Labor should really embrace this idea of a more cooperative approach rather than a confrontational approach. Because I think e- even if it's minority government, I think they can be in government for a long time. <laughs> um, if it, it, it just seems so stupid to me to undermine the strength of candidates who just wiped out key seats of your major opponent. You know, yes. why not let them keep the stuff and keep the seats, you know? Um, it, it's obviously to their advantage in the long run. Maybe yeah. they'll maybe they'll come around to figuring that out. And and, and it's not just the kind of the, the political gamesmanship here. It's better for democracy if they're more flexible in how they approach things rather than having that hard party line and never shifting from it under any circumstances. Having said all that too, and going to your point about the the stage three tax cuts, it's really difficult for any politician in a major party to change their position because the media will just jump all over them because that's just what the media does. They they just love that idea of, but that's not what you said, you know, the classic gotcha, and they hold them to ridiculous standards. The media has no interest in the nuance of that argument whatsoever. I think this is another area where politicians could probably stand up to the media a bit more than they do and not be sucked into those sorts of games because, as as we were saying before, the media just doesn't have the same influence that it used to have. So they could make a lot of fuss about that, but probably not not as many people are paying attention as. And and, and they're not they're, they're not good faith arguments. It's <laughs> not it's it's not like you know like the the Daily Telegraph is going to come out and publish. A, a nuanced, you know, political analysis of whether or not Albanese is doing the right thing by going back on the state three tax cuts. It'll just be, look, we're going to hammer in no matter what on on whatever yeah. issue it is, as soon as it's expedient for us to do so. So he might as well push to do the right things when the time comes, but they well, really exactly. do seem I mean, afraid. Look what look what happened with the price cap on gas. You know, it was suddenly Stalin pictures. <laughs> <laughs> the newspaper um, nu- nuance isn't their strong suit. No, I mean they've they've made themselves a joke. Everybody knows that's what they're going to do. That it means nothing. The Labor Party, the Liberal Party, they're still sort of trapped in that political class thing. They all talk to each other. They all, you know, they they're part of a class, and it, it's it's hard to break out of that group think. I think, but hopefully, you know, I, the the gas price is a pretty good example, I guess, of them being willing to stare down the predictable opposition that they're going to get. Well, I think in that sense, the the gas price issue, it really was rock in a hard place kind of territory. Like if they had caved on that, then they would have just destroyed their their own credibility overnight. And it, it's really baffling to me as, as, as somebody who's in a minor party, looking at the way the Labor government, you know, not just the Labor government, the Labor Party combats with the media. Tim, obviously you, you're very active on Twitter, as, as Steve and I are, and you have the Rusted on Labor supporters going, oh, but the media won't let them do this and that and the other. And it's like you say well, that like yeah, this yeah. is a brand new environment that they're working in. But I think you noted yeah, in the yeah. book that the media have made it difficult for Labor and have been actively arrayed against Labor since the World War II. Like this is not a new thing. You'd think they would have worked it out by now. Yeah, yeah. No, ab- ab- absolutely. But I, I, I think this is the thing. The, they, they think the way to government and to public acceptance is through 
getting the media on side, and to some extent it has been in the past. But I think audiences and voters are dispersed in a way that they haven't been in the past. They're less swayed by that. There are more alternate voices out there, even if they don't have quite the same presence as people with a mainstream platform. So if there was ever a time that you were going to stand up to those guys, now is the time to do it, and maybe they'll figure that out. And and look, you know, in fairness to Albanese and the Labor Party, they're a first-term government. They're feeling their way. It's very early days. We'll see. If they, if they are returned government, either minority or majority government, at the next election, whenever it is, 2025, I mean, this is always the argument. I, I kind of hate this argument. Oh, you know, they're just, they're playing four-dimensional chess and, you know, <laughs> don't don't criticise them because it'll all be good. And that, that often doesn't actually work out. Yeah. Once you compromise your position, you've compromised your position and, and there's no going back on it. And, and that's why they have drifted to the right over the last 30 odd years. But I think there is also probably some truth in that, that, you know, you have to give them a bit of a chance to find their feet and get a bit more confident. Um, yeah. But let, let, let's hope that they mm. do grow a spine about those things. I mean, we have to keep in mind also that, uh, you know, the Prime Minister himself and, and, and a lot of the senior ministers in the Albanese government were present for the Rudd-Gillard civil war. And I think I probably still have a little bit of PTSD over that because they literally threw government away. They absolutely mm, trashed their own government and, and handed a decade of power to the coalition. And it's taken them, a, you know, it's taken them a decade to, to get that back and, and, and regain the trust of the Australian electorate. So I can understand why they might be a little bit gun shy at the moment, and, and as you said, feeling their way and finding their feet and that sort of thing. But what was really interesting in the was in the federal election campaign where Adam Band of all people showed how how easy it, like how quick the media would back off if you just called them on their bullshit with the whole Google it mate thing. Yeah, yeah. Because that transformed the campaign. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Poor Albanese, you know, got this most the stupidest of gotchas and then fell into the trap of not of just going blank on, on the answer at the time. And that created a whole yeah. narrative around the election campaign. And I think Bant did him a massive favour by just chopping the that journalist off at the knees at the press club and just calling it out as, as the ridiculous performance art that it was. No, I, I agree entirely. And I think you're right that he really, I mean, he did us all a favour by killing that because they would have kept that narrative going for the next whatever it was at that stage, the next six weeks. Um, and, and in fact, they did try to. There was another thing that happened where they, they tried to bring it up again and then there was something similar that happened around the um, where he said, you know, you can go and talk. He told the media that they could, if they wanted to hear the details on that, they could go and listen to Jim Chalmers don't get on the bus with me sort of thing. And they freaked out about that as well, oh, yeah. as if that was another gaff sort of thing. So, the, you know, once they smelt blood around the gaff, they were looking for gaffs the whole way through. So, yeah, Bant definitely cut that off at the knees, thank God for all of us. But it, it doesn't go away. It is it is the nature of that sort of journalism, unfortunately, es especially the, the notion of an election bus following politicians around to do these set-piece things where, you know, they, they find out the morning at five o'clock in the morning where they're going for the day and all that nonsense. That it sh The media just shouldn't be on those buses, but they feel like they have to be for some reason. M maybe that changes at the next election, I don't know. But I've been thinking, Margot Kingston's been arguing this since at least 1996, so. You mentioned that in the book, and it was one of the things I thought to ask you was, I don't understand the, the purpose that the buses are serving and then the whole, I think also because Scott Morrison took it to such a ridiculous degree and it literally just became performance yeah. art. But what's the alternative to the buses? I mean, is, is it just locking them in a room and, and, you know, having debates on policy for six weeks? Because, look, as a political nerd, I'm all for that, but I'm not well, sure imagine. what the rest of the country <laughs> would be for it. <laughs> No, but you can you can Margot's idea is that you have um, that you pull that process. So the mainstream media organisations take it in turn to provide a couple of representatives who go with with the politicians, and then they have a pool report on what they actually did because it, you know th th those campaign appearances should be announcements of policies or set piece speeches or you know doing something in particular in an electorate, etc. So you just have a report. 
there who says, well, this is what they did. And, and you take the circus element out mm. of it where you have 50 journalists standing around with cameras and microphones trying to trip up the person. And then hopefully you do, you know, I, as you say, it's, it's probably unlikely that they're going to sit down and have meaningful policy discussions somewhere mm. else. But at least it does take that sporting yeah. yelling for blood sort yeah, of yeah. concentration of that mentality out of the process and and who knows what goodness might emerge in the absence of of that nonsense. I think it was Angus Taylor who showed that he can actually have a press conference without any press present. You know, he he gave that press conference, even asked if there were any questions to an empty room. (laughs) It was just like one guy with a camera there. Any any questions? All right, we'll leave it we'll leave it there. And off he (laughs) goes. No, You're alone, it's, Angus. You're on your own here. It, it's exactly right. But but he knows that it's just going to be a package on That's TV. Right. Exactly They're right. not going to show the audience. They're going to show him asking, are there any questions? You know, yep. it's kabuki. They, they, it's they, yeah. they all play a role. So anything that breaks up those rules of the game is very welcome. So actually, this is another thing. I hadn't really thought about this, but presumably at the next election, the community independence will get a lot more media attention than they did at the last one where they were pretty much ignored. So that whole methodology just doesn't work because they're not going to be on the buses and going around. They're just going to be in their communities and, and working them. So it invites a different sort of um, media methodology in itself, I think. We can only hope. <laughs> yeah, and that's interesting as well because the um, and as you said, the media just ignored them until sort of the final dying days when they they suddenly realised that oh, hang on, they, these guys might win, and then it was sort of this grudging. Yeah. Oh, one or two of them might might just fall over the line. The fact that all of them got over the line, and even um, independents that they didn't see coming, like Daly in Fowler, yeah, yeah. It, it really left the media flat footed, and I think they're still scrambling. Like they, there does seem to be this imperative with the media to just go, oh no, that's just a fluke. That's not going to happen again. And so the result in Victoria, as we, as we discussed, was um, oh, yeah. manner for them because it, it proved their, their theory. And the flip side of that is also is this in, this um, obsession with turning them into uh, a pseudo-political party. Because that's, and I think that's why they keep calling them the Teals rather than community independents because uh, Steve and I have sort of just, we've made a pact that we're just never going to refer to them as the Teal independents because we think it's, it, it's wildly okay. incorrect and slightly insulting. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, it's weird how watching the way the media frame frames the independence as this pseudo-political party in, in the absence of any evidence to the contrary. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. They, it, it is just that they have very particular frames with how they do things. The two-party system is how they've always framed politics. So it's very hard for them to break out of that. If you're in politics, you must be, okay, if there's a bunch of you basically talking about the same thing, you can't all be independents. You must be a party. It's very strange. The the Simon Holmes Accord Climate 200 thing was a complicating factor in that. I don't know if you saw him addressing the press club in March, but all the questions were about, but come on, it really is a party. Yeah. <laughs> How yeah. is it not a party? You know, they, they just they just and he was completely bemused and, and gave good answers, I thought. Mm-hmm. But it, it's it's just hard for them to break out of that. Maybe at the next election, just because of, as I, as I was saying, the nature of how the campaign is going to be, maybe it forces them out of it. Somebody behind the scenes told me that they were contacted pretty constantly about Catherine Deves winning in Warringah against Zali Stegall, and journalists were constantly ringing up and saying, do you think Zali's going to win? We, we hear Catherine Deves is in with a big chance, and... Um, these people were saying, are you kidding? Zoli's going to piss it in, you know? It's, it's, it's not even a competition. But clearly, Morrison's office or whoever was feeding the media this, it's close, it's close, we've got mm-hmm. internal polling that shows it's close. They were desperate to write that story. And, and then when, it, you know, when the voting was done, she didn't even win a ballot box in the electorate, not, not no. one in the whole electorate. So, mm-hmm. you know, she was, she was thrashed. In fact, I saw, I haven't read Nikki Savas' book yet, but she tells the story apparently that Deves broke down and was very upset on election night when she lost because she thought she was going to win as well. She'd been listening to the nonsense as well. So it, it's, it's a great illustration of how they live in an echo chamber. Mm. I have to run away, Tim. 
I'm, I'm going to leave you to keep talking, but I, I have I have duties that I must go and fulfill. It's been fabulous talking to you, and I really appreciate the time to talk to you about this stuff. Oh, I'm going no to leave you in Elena's hands. I'm going to run away, but thank you so much. Nice to meet you, Steve. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, actually, one of the things I wanted to have, uh, ask you about, because I, I was very excited when you referenced the future of us in the book, because um, as I was reading Voices of Us, that was the book that kept coming to mind. So for, for, um, for listeners who are not familiar with your work, Future of Everything was this fantastic treatise that you released a few years ago, which to me seemed like almost like laying out the theory of the kind of society, the kind of political system we could have. And then Voices of Us kind of felt like the sequel. It was a case study in, oh, look, this thing happened and this is this is how, not so much that everything that you predicted in Future of Everything came to be, but it was sort of like a, a treatise on, on you know, what actually happened when that shift occurred. Is, does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, this is part of the reason why I've been so interested in the community independence because I've been talking about this sort of versions of community engagement for a long time now. Um, in fact, my PhD was about that. The book that you mentioned, The Future of Everything, which came out in 2018, looked at some of the very specific models of community engagement around notions of sortition, which is the idea of having political representation that doesn't rely on voting, but relies on sort of a random selection. So it sort of goes back to a very ancient idea of democracy, that democracy is self-rule, and for that to function properly, you don't vote for elected representatives, you take it in turns to do the governance. That's harder to run on the scale of the complex societies that we have these days. But you can incorporate the basic principle into aspects of governance. And, and one of the ways to do that is obviously around how, how communities choose their representatives. So once I saw the methodology that Kathy McGowan used in 2023, um, and then that was picked up by um, Zoe Stegman and Sophie Thompson, and most of the other community independents used this model of community engagement. Oh, you know, I was actually quite excited about it because it, it, it as, you, as you said, it sort of was a practical application of some of the stuff that I've been theorising about for a long time. Um, and, and not only that, but it worked. <laughs> yes. I think <laughs> that is the really right. exciting thing because, yeah, like, like reading well, Voices of Us, I was like, oh, my God, this is all the stuff that you spoke about and it's happened, you know. <laughs> it actually worked. So, yeah, because, I mean, it's not unusual to talk about these things and, and people, you know, listen politely and say, well, that's, you know, that's a lovely theory and wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice if the world was really like that? But, you know, as it turned out, if you build it, they will come and come they did. And it, and it actually translated into elected representatives ending up in the parliament. And, you know, there's, there's a bunch of reasons why that happened. But the basic principle of community engagement was absolutely central to their success as candidates. And it was great to see. You know, I was, I was really thrilled to see it. Me too. Even as a representative of a minor party, I found watching large-scale community engagement with politics as a whole was just thrilling. You know, regardless of, of and obviously, we, you know, the Democrats were not competing with the community independents, and, and I think philosophically we, we were probably quite closely aligned to them. But, you know, having the whole country go, almost wake up from like a, you know, two-decade-long sort of stupor and go, oh, no, that's, this stuff's important. We should actually engage with it. it was just amazing. And no, absolutely. And I, and I think that is the that is actually the response that most people who are involved in these things have. I'd done research on other citizen agenda sort of stuff and things like deliberative polls and citizens' assemblies and stuff. And when you talk to the people who are involved in these things or read what they say, the, the absolute thing that hits you in the face about it is how thrilled they are to be involved in these discussions. And they often go in sceptical, the same sort of, you know, oh, this is just going to be boring politics and they do it out of a sense of civic duty, etc. But when they actually get involved in these discussions, when it's well run and functioning properly as all of these versions were, people come out of it just overwhelmed and moved 
by the fact that they were able to participate in such a meaningful discussion. And then in, in the case of the community independence, for that to actually translate into seats on the ground, so to speak, just adds to the, the worthwhileness of the, of the process, I think, for people. People really respond strongly to it. So, um, and I think it's a, it's a message that particularly the coalition had forgotten. They'd stopped yeah. doing, particularly the Liberal Party, they'd stopped engaging with their grassroots in that way. I think probably the National Party are better at it just because of the nature of the communities that they represent. That You know, it, it tends to be a bit more of a regular thing, but the Liberals had really lost touch with that ability to engage with their public in a meaningful way and the community independents stepped into that breach and took it away from them, basically took those voters away from them, gave them a way to participate that was meaningful to them. Yeah, it was amazing how like how, how quickly and easily the community independents were able to sort of kick away those supports and just have the whole edifice just come crashing down in electorate after yeah. electorate. You know, Kathy um, in Indi and then Zali in uh, Uringu was sort of, as you said, they were very two very specific case studies. I think really the turning point was Kathy handing over to Helen in Indi and maintaining the the, the independent lock on on Indi. What's interesting to me. In the example of, of Wentworth, for example, like Karen Phelps took Wentworth in, in the by-election after Malcolm Turnbull uh, was rolled as, as Prime Minister and quit Parliament, and then the Liberals took it back in the 2019 election and then lost it again to Allegra Spender. And what I find interesting, the narrative around that particular cycle, they talk about, and particularly in the lead-up to the 2022 election where because Dave Sharma was under siege from the community independent movement, the media was sort of collectively losing their minds over it. But looking back, I sort of think, well, no, 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 Dave Sharma was the aberration. You know, Wentworth was probably another canary in the coal mine in firstly going to an independent and Karen Phelps and then brief aberration with, with Sharma and then it returned to to an independent with Allegra Spender. Do you think, like, am, am I barking up the wrong tree or is, is that, do, do you see that as well? Oh, no, I, I- I think you're right. I think people do underestimate the importance of what Karen Phelps did there. Certainly that was the inspiration for Voices of Warringah. And a lot of her team went and worked in Warringah, oh, once, wow. particularly once Ali Stegall came on side. I, I think Stegall herself was um, inspired to make herself available as a candidate, partly in response to what Karen Phelps had done. So it was definitely a thing. It was, it was kind of a transition thing because mm. it was the single biggest margin the Liberals had in the mm. country. So for Karen Phelps to win it was incredible. And that spoke to a fair bit of anger around what had happened to, to Malcolm Turnbull. Their candidate, their Prime mm. Minister had been done over badly by the party and they wanted revenge for that. And, and of course, a by-election is the perfect opportunity for that. But she did the damage, you know, she mm. she ate away at the margin by winning that. So even though she lost at the next federal election and it swung back to the Liberals and Dave Sharma was elected, the rot had set in at that stage. So once a viable community independent emerged in the form of a league spender, in a lot of ways, you know, she's the she's the Wentworth candidate from central casting, you know, she's kind of oh, perfect. Yeah. But for that electorate, obviously, they were they were happy to go back. You know, again, you know, they they, they knew from experience the the sky hadn't fallen in just because they had an independent member, and then all the other stuff that we've already talked about kicked in as well. You know, the Morrison factor and etc. Uh, etc. Et so I, I think it was a transition electorate in a lot of ways for for that group of people. It it showed them that could be done. It also taught them how to do it. And so that expertise went up to Warringah and then went up to McKellar um, and helped in those electorates as well. So it was absolutely vital. I think Karen Phelps' role doesn't get quite enough attention. The media sort of framed it as like the natural way of things sort of reasserting itself with um, when, when she lost. Yeah, yeah. But it was like, no, 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 she, that was a massive insurrection. No. What, what was the margin? Like he was on 25% margin or something. So was she, crazy, she, yeah. she, turned around, yeah, she turned around a huge deficit and got across the line and they were never going to go back to that afterwards. Maybe if Turnbull had come back, but that was never going to happen either. I, and I, I think actually, you know, the whole Turnbull story is, is central to this. I think that was the turning point for a lot of the candidates in particular. They were, you know, they were pretty safe 
liberal voters on the whole, but their idea of the Liberal Party was the, the Turnbull Liberal Party. It was the Morrison Liberal Party. So when the party itself destroyed Malcolm Turnbull's prime ministership, that was a real eyes wide open moment for a lot of those candidates. Kylie Tink is, um, I remember listening to an interview with her where she, she singled out that as the, as the turning point for her that, oh, well, the party has left me. I haven't left the party. So um, oh. I'm going to run as an independent. It was, it was vital. Yeah, a number of our members, you know, we've had the same sort of conversation with them. I mean, one of the members here in WA was a senior member of the Liberal Party for 20 years and yeah, yeah. They, um, quit the party in disgust in 2019 and then and came over to us when they changed the rules last year around needing 1,500 members instead of 500 members to register. There's, yeah, there's a large number of people who looked at the Liberal Party and just went, no, you've just abandoned me, I'm out. It was, it was definitely a thing of, of what was happening. But having lost them, having abandoned them, I don't think they're getting them back. No. That, that, that's the, but, I mean, I mean that's, it's, that's not clear yet, but I, I, I think something fundamental has changed. Um, and, and this is another thing about the Victorian election. Even though uh, none of the community independents actually won a seat, the, the number of people voting for other than the major parties was above 30% again for the first time. Mm. So, you know, there's, there's still that underlying change. Um, that, as I call in the book, that elevated middle, that 30% that's kind of floating and looking for somewhere to attach its vote, I think that's mm. still very solid there and, um, and, and that's what's not going to go away. You're never yeah, going to get exactly. back to Liberal and Labor getting 45% of the primary vote each. That's just not going to happen anymore. So that, that vote's yeah. got to go somewhere. Yeah, because I feel like it's it's um it's almost like a, a self-reinforcing thing now. Like you can sort of see in, in – I mean, Labor getting returned in Queensland at the height of the pandemic, I think people just went, oh, yeah, well, that's an amazing result for Anastasia Palaszczuk, but – you know, they didn't think anything of it. And then you had the McGowan um, tsunami in WA, you had the South Australian election, the Victorian election, the federal election, and it just seemed like the sort of pattern is clearly established of you can vote for, you know, independents and minor parties who are not either of the two legacy parties and the world's not going to end. Even though, um, yeah, you know, yeah. Labor got returned, you know, with, with quite large margins. But like you said, the primary vote is still suppressed. The, the next cycle of election, uh, sort of elections, is going to be really, really interesting to see where things land and 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 if that pattern continues. Do you think because because the media have have one of their favourite thingies to trot out is like, oh well, the Labor Party are going to be challenged by independence in the future as well, and and sort of see this as an inevitability, almost to sort of deflect away from the you know the decimation of the Liberal Party. Do you think that's actually a risk? Oh, yeah, for sure. And, I mean, it happened in Fowler. Yeah, true, yeah. Good they, point. Were, they were done over by an independent in Fowler, which they should have seen coming. But, I mean, that's a classic case of they tried to parachute in, a, you know, one of their stars and the, the local community rejected her entirely and, and went with Di Lee, who, you know, it wasn't a community independent in the same way um, that the so-called teals were. She wasn't doing the, the same methodology, but she was a very well-established and respected local person. You know, she had those networks, absolutely, and you know, she won quite comfortably in the end. Ob obviously, the Labor Party thought, you know, they, they, they saw problems with parachuting someone in, but I, I don't think they doubted for a minute that Keneally would win. And no. She, she I... did not win. <laughs> no, I mean that you know Fowler used to be one of the safest of safe seats for Labor. Yeah, they, so... they probably expected to take a bit of a hit on it, but you know a bit of a protest vote. But I'm, I'm sure they thought oh, Christina Canelli was going to win, but Dilo blitzed her for exactly those reasons. It's the same reasons. It was so. So I think I, I think Labor is definitely vulnerable to this sort of challenge. Ha having said that, there doesn't seem to be, I, you know, I can't really. There, there doesn't seem to be a real movement in that direction. But I think it's happening. I, I think the other thing to note, what will happen in regional seats with the National Party, the National Party didn't lose any of their seats at the last election, but their mar margins were reduced drastically. I, I'm thinking of uh, seats like Groom in Queensland around the Darling Downs. Uh, Susie Holt up there, she didn't win, but she reduced the national guy was on 
I think it was 26%, and she got him down to about 6%. And I think she's running again. So she's in with um she's in with a pretty good chance. So again, you know, it's 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 just as you, as you say, there's some momentum around this now. It isn't it isn't novel. It doesn't seem um, unfathomable and uh, undoable. In fact, the opposite. It seems um, I wouldn't say it's inevitable, but it's it's certainly seen as as a possibility now. So it, it's going to encourage people to do it to to run. It's going to encourage. Uh, independent people to, to come out and or, or it isn't actually just independent candidates presenting themselves the key to it is communities getting together having these discussions and letting candidates emerge from that process that's the key to it and if, if you can instigate that sort of methodology it's really powerful you know as, as a member of a party that that once dominated the senate i have a vested interest in this but how do you think that translates to a senate vote because obviously that's a statewide vote and i know that there was a party that tried to be registered in the lead up to the election for independence for the senate which was an interesting way of approaching yeah. it because obviously the way the senate vote does not lend itself to this kind of independent candidate running because you, you need that the whole group ticket thing on the, on the Senate. I think the next election will, will be a consolidation of the gains of the community independence in the lower house. But I think at some stage, the, the, the public are going to turn their attention to the Senate as well. I think this is already happening in the Senate. And I think people are very comfortable with that being the case in the Senate. People don't see it as a state's house anymore, which is what it was designed as. It's seen as a, as a check on the balance of power against the, the lower house. And people like that the two parties don't dominate there and, and are happy to have the crossbench with the balance of power. You know, they're not always happy with the, with the outcome, but in the general principle of Labor and either the Labor Party or the Liberal Party controlling the house – our experience with the Senate probably trained us, prepared us for the same thing happening for the lower house. I know people whinge about the Senate and stuff like that, but essentially we keep returning crossbenches with the balance of power. The one time that we didn't do it in recent history was the last Howard government, and we got work choices because of that. So I, th- I think people are very comfortable with that, and the, their, their comfort with it in the Senate made them more comfortable about it in the lower house as well. So, you know, to answer your question, or we'll to go back to the point of your question, is I think what's happening in the lower house has has been happening in the upper house for a long time already and, and will continue to happen. It will still have, I doubt very much, Labor or Liberal are going to end up with the balance of power in the Senate anytime soon. Because the whole work choices thing is quite recent history, I think people remember that and are probably are even more determined now not to have that have that repeat because it, it didn't work out well for the country. It wasn't, you know, no, um, no, no, the, the absolute worst thing that happened for Howard was getting untrammeled power. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was, he was given enough rope and he hanged himself to the point where he lost his own seat. You know, this is actually, it's probably another thing worth thinking about is, you know, a four-term prime minister in many ways often held up as one of our great prime ministers and reasonably popular even, maybe up till the end. But, you know, he lost his seat. People kind of forget this. The media certainly threw it into the memory hole pretty quickly, but he lost his seat. And, and, And again, the seat is back with the Labor Party now from the last election. So it didn't go independent, but it was another reasonably safe Liberal seat that switched went somewhere else, went to Libra in this case. So, Actually, yeah, that's um, a really good point. You know, it, it, it all speaks to a, a, a certain, I was going to say volatility, but it's it's that, that makes it sound like it's random. I don't think it's random at all. I think people are being very focused in how they're approaching this. They're, they're not, this is, I, it's part of the reason I don't like the term about tactical voting that you hear, that people, Labor voters voted tactically in the blue ribbon seats. Well, yeah, to some extent that they did, but a lot of people made a conscious decision to vote independent. It wasn't just tactical about getting rid of the Liberal Party. It was a positive vote in favour of the community independence. Yeah, I, I, I'm really glad you brought that up because that was on my list of things to ask you and I forgot about it. But yeah, I found that that, that finding from the electoral study, well, the way that the media sort of latched onto it and, and just went, see, you, you know, it was almost a repudiation of the, <laughs> the choices made by the people in those electorates because 
I mean, what is what is tactical voting but using the preferential voting system the way it was designed to be used? Exactly. It's so, it's so weird. You know, the, the media runs around saying, oh, people are disengaged. And then so, you know, these huge community organisations form in these electorates and get independents elected. And, oh, okay, so they're not disengaged. They're voting tactically. You know, it, it can never be what it actually is. That they, They're very reluctant to give voters credit for having made a positive decision about where their vote goes. And I think that's the key thing here, that sure, there's an element of tactical voting in it. But as you say, it's just using the voting system that we have in sort of the way it's designed to be used, that you, you can preference your voting in that way. And and that's exactly what people did and got an outcome that they're quite happy with. And good for them. And I, I think it comes back to the way the media just can't conceive of an electorate that doesn't want to have a conservative party in power, a conservative government. <laughs> it's, so, it's so strange. They, um, well, it's, it's not strange. It's not without reason that the Liberal Party is the most successful party in Australian history. The, the notion that it would fall in into a black hole in the way that it has in such a short amount of time is kind of incredible in a lot of ways. But there it is. The evidence is there. It's it's a burning heat on the near horizon. It's not hard to see. Let's start reporting it in those terms rather than, oh, you know, this is, a, this is an aberration. We're going to go back to normal next time. I don't, I don't think that framing is, is correct at all. So one, one thing that occurred to me when we were chatting about capital and, and political representation of capital and essentially uh, I would say almost state capture of capital over the last 10 or 15 years, I was thinking of, of the future of everything and also Voices of Us. And do you think part of this, this big shift we've had has been the electorate waking up to the way capital has used politics to further their own interests. I mean, I was thinking in terms of the fact that capital in Australia is actually sort of quite lazy. They have their, in some cases, um, you know, uh, oligopolies or duopolies, and it does limit their incentive to innovate and, and they, they strangle competition quite thoroughly uh, whenever it dares to emerge un, un, unbidden. And I think that has led us down paths where the consumers of capital are now feeling the effects of that in terms of wage suppression, you know, enormously high housing prices. I think one of the things that came out of the electoral study was the fact that the myth of or, or the pattern of people becoming more conservative as they get older and, and, and attain assets has been broken because my generation, which is Gen X, can no longer afford those assets. And so yeah. we're staying, you know, socialist lefties because we don't own the means of production. Because uh, do you think maybe, oh. you know, part of the, the that activation politically and the rise of the community independence has been, you know, if we talk about tactical voting, a, a tactical almost just a sort of strategic response to the, that capital overreach? Oh, without a doubt. And this is an argument I make pretty strongly in the book is I, I think the underlying force that is driving all of these changes is changes to our essential economic model, which traces back to the beginning of the, the Hawke-Keating government and the opening up of the economy to market forces, etc., which meant privatisation of public services and the, the selling of public properties to private owners, etc. So injecting a layer of competition and profit-making into community services that wasn't there before. And this not only tends to make those services more expensive and harder to access and gives people less control over them because governments are now just managing the money that goes to private companies to run these things. They're not actually running them themselves. So they're run in the interests of shareholders rather than in the interests of citizens. All of that starts to melt the connective tissue that holds the society together. And I, and I think that's very much what people were reacting against. It's, it's been building for 30 years, but again, it was another one of these things. It was one of the key value things that came to a head in this election. Again, I think Scott Morrison embodied it and vocalised it with his, I don't hold a hose, mate. I'll, I'll go away and have a holiday. I don't have a role here. There are services that deal with this. And then, you know, we even had the ridiculous situation during the floods with Peter Dutton, instead of 
doing something as a member of the government, organised a GoFundMe to raise funds for people affected by floods. You know, this this is a complete undermining of the of the social contract that, as as most people understood it. So while I think we have become much more individualistic and we probably are happier with less government involvement in things than we were in the past, we still see ourselves as a society. We still we still think of ourselves as members of communities. And the two-party system kind of, you know, because, you know, they're virtually as one on the economics of all of this stuff. They're very similar in, in key areas, right down to stage three tax cuts. You know, people people didn't like the direction the country was heading. And the, the examples you gave of not being able to buy the assets that, you know, we kind of expected to be able to buy as we moved into our 30s and 40s houses, et cetera, et cetera, and work being more precarious, you know. So I think, you know, there's this general sense of we've fucked up the, the housing market, we've fucked up jobs, you know, everything's precarious, you can't buy a house. The public health system's under enormous stress. You know, you, you probably, I had a friend the other day who went and sat for nine hours in casualty to be dealt with because it was full up with kids with COVID, basically. Mm-hmm. You know, all, all of this, all of that stuff that we understood as part of the social contract, it feels like for a lot of people it's falling apart before our eyes. So why in God's name would you reward the people <laughs> whose, whose policies, um, you know, the two-party system gave us this? That's exactly what it gave us. We talk about polarisation, but in fact, it's bipartisanship on those matters that's been the problem. And so... You know, we're using the tools that the system provides us as best we can to break down those structures that have delivered this unfortunate outcome that we're not happy with. And it takes time and and it's a bit mercurial in a way. You know, you can't just get rid of the Labor Party and get rid of the Liberal Party and put a bunch of independents in, but we can use the tools that we have, which is largely preferential voting system and the fact that we can still organise at a community level and affect what change we can. And that's exactly what's happened. And it's been really powerful. And it's very hard to see that that just disappears. Unless the Labor Party as a government somehow does everything that most people want and consolidates a position, which seems very unlikely, um, then I think there's going to be a place that that 30% is going to stay constant, if not grow. I don't think it's going to shrink substantially. Gosh, I know you need to run off free soon. Is there anything that yes. you'd like I'd like to you know, to cover uh, before we wrap up that, you, that we, you feel that we haven't covered or...? No, I think it's 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 been good discussion. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for having me along, and uh, and 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 thanks for reading the book carefully. It's it's very obvious when you talk to people whether they've read the book or not. <laughs> so so thank you, <laughs> thank you for um, uh, a, a good discussion. The, the only the only thing that I would add is that the point that I make towards the end of the book is that this, again, is a transition period. There's nothing settled at this stage, and there's still a lot up for grabs, and it's not clear what path we actually go down. I feel pretty confident, as I say, that that 30% stays stays in place, that the major parties never get that 30% of primary vote back. So that means there's going to be a role for smaller parties and independents on an ongoing basis. But the the nature of the voting system, you know, that doesn't always translate into seats. So it, it still is a bit up in the air. So I'm not, you know, I'm not quite sure what the next election looks like, but I, I don't think we should underestimate the level of change that we've witnessed at the last election. It's it's huge. It's yeah. absolutely a, a shattering change to Australia's two-party system. And we need to uh, we need to acknowledge that and and actually appreciate it because this is this is another thing I say in the book is Australia has actually handled those forces in a much more democratic and balanced way than a lot of other countries. America's falling apart at the seams because it it hasn't been able to manage these forces. We've managed them in a in a pretty good democratic way on the whole. You know, my line that I use these days is two cheers for Australian democracy. There's it's it's sort of it's not perfect, but we, we should give ourselves a bit of a pat on the back for the way we've handled these incredibly difficult situations that have developed. And of course was all exacerbated by COVID as well. 
So it's you know, they're huge issues. Um, so you know, that, I, I think that's the, I'd, I'd leave it on a fairly positive note. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but yeah, two, two cheers for Australian democracy. I love it. It's a great way to end on. Thank you so much, Tim. We loved your book and we loved this discussion, and, and so grateful for you for coming on and having a chat to us about it. Thanks, Alana. That's great. Thank you again to Tim for being so generous with his time and his insights. Do read his book. As Steve said, it was a political page turner and a fascinating look into the grassroots advocacy that is transforming our politics. And if you enjoy Voices of Us, you can keep up with Tim at his Future of Everything substack, where he continues to write about democracy, media and the future of everything. Most of Tim's writing on the blog is available for free, but that's made possible by paid subscriptions on the basis that people like me pay for Tim's work so everyone can enjoy it. Paid subscriptions also allow Tim to commission other writers to contribute to the future of everything. So if you like Tim's work and you want to support the future of everything Substack, you can subscribe and get access to all of his work, as well as chat to Tim and other readers in the comment section. I've been following Rick Morton's coverage of the Robo Debt Royal Commission hearings. As well as his extraordinary articles in the Saturday paper, he's been providing live commentary on the hearings on Twitter. And he had an exchange with someone on Twitter about what the point of the Royal Commission was. Why go through all this effort and theatrics when nothing will change? No one will be held to account. The architects of this hideous scheme will get off scot-free, etc., etc., etc. And it came to mind while I was editing the podcast, that cynicism and apathy around why become politically engaged, why engage with our democracy when all politicians and political parties are the same and so on and so forth. And our discussion with Tim highlighted for me exactly why we should engage with our democracy and and why we should be politically engaged. Because the system is the way it is, only because of that apathy and that reluctance to engage. Voices of Us is a very recent and very real life case study of the kind of change we can usher in if we engage with our democracy beyond turning up on election day and getting a democracy sausage. You might think that the next election is ages away, and in some ways it is, but this quiet time between elections is when engagement with politics is most critical. The grassroots democracy that delivered all those community independents to the parliament didn't happen overnight. It literally took years to build those movements and gain the support of those communities. If you want to engage with our democracy, now is the time. If you're represented by an independent, reach out to them and volunteer. They're going to need your help to get re-elected in 2025. They've just got done demonstrating that incumbency is no guarantee of hanging on to a seat and we can't afford to lose their advocacy just yet. Join the Democrats. As Tim and I discussed, we can't forget the Senate's role in holding the government of the day to account. Imagine a Senate crossbench so large that whoever is in government has to negotiate with them on every single bill, even if the opposition supports it. Imagine the society we could become if the government of the day was forced to govern in the interests of the nation and not the interests of capital. This is why grassroots democracy is so powerful. Add your voice to the 30% of the voting population who made the voices of us possible and see what else we can change. Keep the Bastards Honest is brought to you by the Australian Democrats. This episode was edited and produced by me, Alana Mitchell. If you'd like to keep in touch, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and LinkedIn by searching for Australian Democrats And you can see what we stand for, what we value, and what our policy positions are at our website at democrats.org.au. Until next time, thanks for listening. 